morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kai Chin. I'm a PhD candidate from Imperial College London. Unfortunately, because of uh, various students, our team cannot join the conference in person, but still I'm quite excited to present our work. So today I will present uh, SOK work, uh, Decentralized Finance Attacks. Uh, this is a joint work uh, with uh, 10 authors from six uh, different institutions. So let's get started. Um, if you are a blockchain user, and especially if you are, you are a DeFi user, I'm pretty sure that your crypto uh, currency assets are threatened by uh, different kinds of uh, decentralized finance attacks. Um, so if you follow up uh, uh, the medium or you are an active member of the DeFi community, uh, you will see uh, a number of DeFi attacks like happening every week. Uh, if it's not every day. So this attack causes millions of uh, US dollars of user loss. So DeFi attacks have become actually a major concern for DeFi in development and the wide adoption. So this work, we want to systematically study these DeFi attacks. So in the first place, I would like to clarify that we don't have a formal or a clear definition of uh, what is uh, what a DeFi attack is. So, uh, but we in, in the paper we try to uh, stay scientific and try to stay consistent by collecting DeFi attacks from different data source and try to cross validate uh, from, uh, among different data source. So we perform uh, a, a number of analysis on these DeFi attacks. But in today's talk, I won't uh, cover all these details. Uh, I will only like uh, share with you some of the interesting insights we find out uh, while uh, performing this study. And if you are interested, uh, please check out the paper. OK, so how does a DeFi attack look like? I want to give you an uh, example, the BZX attack, uh, which is uh, essentially an Oracle manipulation attack that was executed in the February 2020. Uh, BZX attack uh, was actually one of the very first DeFi attacks. Um, so if you look on a high level, you will see like uh, the, the, the attacker first takes a flash loan from a lending platform and uh, form several like uh, asset exchanges and uh, try to manipulate the asset price. And based on this manipulated and unfair price, the attacker profits uh, by borrowing some assets from the lending platform and uh, lastly pay back uh, the flash loan. So, um, if you are interested in details, we have another paper discussing like uh, in details how this BZX attack uh, was executed. So if you're interested, please check it out. So on high level, we can see that this attack costs the attacker about 100 US dollars as a transaction fee, but the eventual output profit is more than 600,000 US dollars. So it's quite uh, high uh, PNL, uh, so to speak. And the, the funny part is, the attacker didn't execute this transaction optimally. We find that if the attacker if the attacker sets the attacker parameter optimally, uh, the 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 optimal attacker profit can reach more than one million US dollars. So this is one of the interesting findings that many attackers uh, didn't uh, execute attackers optimally. So um, the BDEX attack uh, was actually a very old attack uh, because um, it uh, was executed in the early uh, 20, 2020. And since then, the blockchain ecosystem, uh, and especially the Ethereum ecosystem, has evolved quite a lot. So nowadays, we have not only the peer-to-peer -peer network, we also have the flashboards, and we have different uh, MEV extractors, front runners, 
So now the question is, how is an attack, attack executed nowadays? And what's an attacker supply chain look like? So for those who are not familiar with flashbots, flashbots is basically a, a private relay uh, that allows uh, users to submit the transactions privately to the miners or validators uh, without touching the peer-to-peer -peer network. So it's essentially a private channel between transaction senders and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, validators. So if we look at the diagram, we, we have the, uh, the time as the x-axis and the peer-to-peer the -peer network. So if the attacker submits the attack transaction uh, to the peer-to-peer -peer network, what would happen? So because the peer-to-peer -peer network, the blockchain peer-to-peer -peer network is public, and uh, any entity can observe any transaction propagated in this network uh, publicly. So once the attacker submits this attack transaction, there can be two scenarios. So we have some upchargers who can detect this attack transaction. And if this attack transaction creates an upcharge opportunity, the upcharger can back around this attack transaction by bundling the attack transaction as well as the uh, upcharge transaction into one bundle and submit to flashbots. So because of the special setup of the flashbots and private relays, uh, this upcharge bundle can actually help accelerate the attack transaction, uh, which means this attack transaction, uh, this, uh, attack transaction can be uh, executed earlier. So in the second scenario, we have some front runners. Uh, so the front runner can try to replace the attack transaction with its own attack transaction. So, uh, but the, in in the front runners uh, attack transactions, the uh, the front runner deviates the revenue to its own address instead of giving to the original attacker. So such a strategy is also called. Uh, um, the imitation attack or Im imitation game. So if you are interested in the imitation topic, we have another paper that will be presented at Usenix Security in this October. So uh, look it up if you are interested. So we have looked into this 181 uh, DeFi attacks, and we find that 18 of these attacks are actually, we are actually send or execute it through this flashbots API. I want to bring your attention that some of these uh, attacks are actually white hat, so-called white hat hackers. So basically the uh, protocol operators find the vulnerabilities and they attack themselves. And the reason they use the uh, flashbots API is to uh, try to protect their white hack Red Hat hackers from these generalized front runners. And we interestingly find out that six of uh, these attacks uh, were actually accelerated by, for instance, upcharge traders through these uh, upcharge bundles I just mentioned. So another interesting insight we find from this study is that um, 56% of the attacks are not executed automatically. So even if the attacker uses a flash loan, the attack may not be automatic because the attacker may deploy an attack contract before the actual attack. So um, if we look at the life cycle, so we can see an attacker initially deploy an attack contract and typically after minutes or sometimes even uh, days, the first attack uh, transaction will be executed. And sometimes there are multiple attack transactions. So um, again, the whole transaction uh, attack process can last for minutes or even days. So, so from this fact, like uh, the attacker can take days, we actually find that 
this will leave us a rescue window because if we can find out or we can predict that there will be attack after the attacker deploys its attack trend, uh, attack contract, we can actually try to uh, try to prevent the attacks by, for instance, uh, the protocol operators can uh, pause the protocol or users can immediately uh, remove liquidity, for instance, from liquidity pools. So you, you may wonder like how this detection can be done because contract bytecode is not human readable, right? And um, uh, it, it is quite hard to, to predict an attack uh, without like actually seeing the attack transactions, at least in the mempool. So we actually find out uh, we can, we can base, base on the past uh, victim uh, contract and the, like a past anniversary contracts by examining the similarity of these con uh, smart contracts. So uh, we, we did a very simple study in this work. Um, so we, we find out like uh, we, we basically uh, take the, the contract bytecode, we, we chop the, the bytecode into engrams, we create some embeddings, and we just simply compare the similarities of these embeddings. And uh, surprisingly, we find out uh, these uh, victim contracts and the risk contracts do show some similarity. Uh, and we believe that this is a promising direction that we can uh, use to prevent uh, DeFi attacks. At least we can do some active intuition detection. Okay, so um, I'm running out of time. Uh, so I will just uh, skip the case study and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions? If so, you should go to the mic. If not, then I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you define the, dis the difference between uh, a DeFi attack and just a smart uh, trader trying to make money? Uh, so what is the, yeah. Yeah, so um, so basically, I mean, to be honest, we don't have, as I mentioned, we, we don't have a clear definition like what is attack or what is upcharge. I mean, sometimes the attack can be upcharge. So our way is to based on, um, based on the, so we basically on the data source, we collect from diff, uh, several different data sources, like uh, some uh, from some auditing companies and some like social media. And the general rule is like uh, some users lost asset or lost money in this incident, let's say. So we, we typically define these uh, transactions as attacks. Okay, but uh, maybe on a more philosophical level, uh, like sometimes users lose money because they're not smart enough and they buy stocks that go down. Uh, how do you, <laughs> what's the difference between this and an, an attack? Yeah, so in, in this case, like if a user uh, purchase like uh, some asset at, uh, at uh, let's say a, a bad price, there's no the concept of attack, right? This is just a mistake of this single user. So, um, so there's like, uh, there's no vulnerabilities exploited and uh, basically there's no active action like uh, performed by uh, any attacker or any entity. So we try to exclude such transactions uh, from our data set. Okay, oh, there's another question here. Yeah. Okay, hi, uh, this is Zhuo from Purdue, and it's a great talk. So I, I am curious, like you mentioned that there is a time difference or time windows between the attacker deploy the exploit contract and then launch the real attack. So I'm just curious about how long, like the average time between the deployment and the real attack, like, like how many days or yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, sorry, I, I cannot remember the detailed numbers, but uh, I can remember on average that the uh, time frame uh, should be like minutes level, uh -huh. and but uh, the maximum can be days. I see, I see. yeah, thank you. Hi, 
Uh, this is Robert McLaughlin from UC Santa Barbara. Hi. Um, so my question is uh, regarding your uh, similarity analysis for adversarial contracts. Um, you find a pretty high correlation. I'm wondering if you tested um, the, uh, the similarity to just random benign contracts. In other words, is the correlation truly indicative of like its adversarial nature, or is it perhaps common libraries included in many different uh, smart contracts? Um, so you mean the similarity between like uh, these benign benign contracts and uh, and the adversary contract, right? If I understand correctly. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, so I'm. Big, I mean, this this study is quite uh, like uh, uh, like. Uh, Simple is a very simple part of this this work, so we didn't do uh, like a comprehensive or like a deep analysis of this like how how to compare the risk contracts and the, the, the benign contracts. Okay. So I uh, will say this is our future work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot, and let's thank the speaker again.